Hello, very warm welcome to this launch of Whitehall Monitor 2021. I'm Roman Maddox, I'm the director of the Institute. And this is very much a flagship document for us. It's a flagship event when we bring this out every year. We try and put the size and shape of government into numbers and lots and lots of charts. And then everyone talks about it. Um, well, we're really looking forward to talking about it today. Um, we have, a, uh, first of all, presenting it, we have Tim Durrant, who is the lead author out of nine IFG people who contributed to this. And indeed, I mean, that the production of this very much goes on the whole year with people talking about it and, uh, and putting out um, uh, snippets and advanced briefings, if you like, of, of bits of it as government data comes out. We have Meg Hillier, Labour MP, Chair, Chair of the House of Commons Public Accounts Committee. We have Dame Sue Owen, former Permanent Secretary at the Department for Cult Digital, Culture, Media and Sport. And we have with us as well, Lewis Goodall, policy editor on the BBC's Newsnight. A very warm welcome to them as well. Well, we're going to, we have a lot to talk about and many different angles of this. But first, Tim is going to take us through some of the main findings. Tim, well done. And um, please do take it away. Brilliant. Thank you, Bronwyn. Thank you, everyone, for being here. So uh, we have some slides which I'm going to run through and we'll give a highlight of the uh, of the report. But as Bronwyn said, it has really been a team effort and there is a huge amount of work in there. So I do encourage you after the discussion, please do check it out on our website and see the detail for yourselves. Uh, so I'm going to start by talking about how we approach this report. So I think those of you who are uh, regular uh, attendees at IFG Whitehall Monitor launches will know that the last few years in government have been fairly eventful. But I think it is fair to say that uh, 2020 was unlike anything else in, in recent times. Uh, the pandemic forced the government to change the way it works in many ways. And um, it saw the government play a bigger role in everyday life than has been the case probably ever. Um, when we started this work, what we asked ourselves was, how have the events of 2020 changed the government? Principally, of course, we mean the pandemic, but we were also thinking about uh, the preparations for the end of the, the Brexit transition period and the implications of the election result at the end of 2019 as well. So we divide our findings into two broad categories. Um, those changes that um, were a result of the pandemic and which, which saw the government doing things differently out of necessity. Um, and those changes that the government particularly Boris Johnson and his, his close team, have introduced to, to make changes to how government works because of uh, priorities that they have. These aren't hard and fast categories, there is inevitably some overlap. And then the report finishes, and I'll finish my presentation with a short look ahead to um, the rest of this year and some of the big challenges on the horizon for the government. So to begin, if we talk about uh, some of the impacts of the pandemic, um, we begin our report looking at the financial implications. And I think it's fair to say that the government spent a lot more money in 2020 than the previous years. Uh, the extra spending as a result of the pandemic uh, has, has topped £200 billion, which has pushed total public spending over £1 trillion for the first time ever in this financial year. And um, the, this has pushed the deficit uh, up to its highest level as a proportion of GDP since the Second World War. The government is going to borrow nearly 400 billion pounds this year. Now that increase is mainly driven um, by the increase in spending, but has also seen uh, the government has also seen a reduction in uh, tax revenue resulting from the reduced economic activity across the country. If we dig down into the detail of that spending a little bit, we've seen uh, the government spending money in new ways. Uh, so this chart breaks down some of the um, the ways it spent the money, but there is much more detail in the report. The blue bar shows that there's been a big increase to spending on public services, uh, things like obviously particularly the health service, including PP procurement, test and trace, Nightingale hospitals and so on. But this also covers things like uh, the extra money for free school meals. Excuse me, sorry about that. Um, the extra money for free school meals, the um, support for the railways where there were problems um, uh, because of reduced passenger numbers and so on. Um, and it also includes an uplift to uh, the budgets of the devolved administrations uh, in the last year. Now, some of that procurement, uh, we argue in the report, um, was uh, not done as effectively as possible, given the fact that the government wanted to spend money, they wanted to buy in the goods and services needed during the pandemic, but they were unable or they, or they, they, they chose to go through less competitive routes in order to make that procurement quicker. 
We think that was understandable at the beginning of the crisis, but we argue in the report that as, as the pandemic wore on, there should have been changes to processes to improve that employment. We also um, uh, see uh, greater support for businesses and households uh, through the pandemic, which are the second two columns on that chart. So we see uh, the CJRS, the big uh, yellow gold um, block in the middle there, which is the furlough scheme, has topped £50 billion this year. There's also been support for self-employed people and greater welfare payments. And then on the business side, we've seen loans, including the bounce back loan scheme, business rates relief and various grants. And again, we argue in the report, this may, it makes sense for the government to spend this money and particularly at the beginning to spend it quickly. But some issues have arisen where we think the money could have been better targeted or where there could have been better uh, systems built in to prevent fraud, particularly on the bounce back loan scheme. And we think it's it's a, an oversight that the government hasn't made those improvements through the pandemic. As well as make, uh, spending money quickly, one of the things we look at is the way that the government has made decisions and the fact that it's made decisions often very quickly or at times quite slowly. This chart shows uh, various policy U-turns that the government has made over the last 12 months or so. Uh, some of those are, we think, understandable, whether a result of changing evidence or greater understanding of the pandemic. For example, the recommendation to wear masks on public transport only came in in the spring after sort of enough scientific evidence had accumulated on the benefits of that. But some other U-turns, uh, we argue, are due to undue optimism on, on the part of ministers. So examples here include where the education secretary said that all children would be able to go back to school before the summer last year, which later turned out not to be possible. Or indeed, more recently, when the prime minister told Andrew Marr that it was safe for children to go back to school at the beginning of the year before announcing a, another lockdown in England. And then there's a third group of U-turns, which are, we think, down to sort of misjudgments, perhaps of the political mood on the part of the government, and often misjudgments of their own backbenchers. So I'm thinking of things here, the free school meals um, uh, issue is a, is a particularly good example. Obviously, the, the campaigns led by the footballer Marcus Rashford saw government uh, changing its position on that several times. But also things like the house building formula, which, which, which was adapted at the end of last year, and the decision on Huawei and the 5G network were often a result of pressure from conservative backbenchers as much as um, from the public and from the media. Given all of this, it's no surprise that the civil service continues to grow. Nearly 10,000 officials entered the civil service between December 2019 and September 2020, which is the most recent date for which we have figures. And this continues the trend we've seen since the referendum and means that nearly half of the coalition's cuts to staff numbers have now been reversed. Now, where these civil servants end up has changed as a result of the pandemic. The Department for Health and Social Care, DHSC, has seen an increase of nearly a quarter in staff numbers over those that nine month period between December last year and uh, December 19 and September 2020. Um, the Treasury similarly has grown by about a fifth, obviously another uh, department very important in the response to the pandemic. And other departments working on Brexit and the sort of aftermath thereof have also seen increases with DIT, the Trade Department and Bayes, the Business Department also seeing quite significant increases. As well as there being more officials, um, like many of the rest of us, they've been working from home. And like many of the rest of us, uh, they've seen issues with the technology that they've been using. So at the beginning of the crisis, when around 90% of officials in all departments, apart from DWP, were working from home, uh, there were many issues in terms of getting uh, different bits of software to talk to each other. This chart shows uh, that some departments were using Microsoft Teams, some were using Google Meet, some were using Skype. And the red shows where their, that department um, could not access the other bits of software that were being used by other departments. So one of the first big challenges for the government digital service was, one of the first big challenges for the government digital service was to um, adapt and make sure that all of the bits of software could talk to each other. The, um, uh, the result of this was by July, um, every department could access Microsoft Teams, which is the, the full green column there, but also that they were able to access more of the other bits of software being used by other departments. There was, however, it seems, a continuing reluctance to use Zoom amongst government departments, which I think is quite interesting. So we've seen changes inside government, but we've also seen um, a, a sort of a greater demand for information from, from the outside. Now, um, the press conferences, of course, a big sign of this, the daily press conferences as they were in, in lockdown last year, um, were you know, a huge sort of 
part of the day, I think, for, for many of us. And actually, at their peak in May, they hit 27 million viewers. Um, but there have been other ways that the government has been communicating with people, uh, including through gov.uk. So this chart shows where numbers of, of hits on gov.uk and specific parts of gov.uk. And here we see how um, uh, visits to Public Health England website and the Department of Health and Social Care peaked very strongly uh, in, in the spring ahead of the first lockdown. And then for the department, uh, there was a, a continuing rise through the autumn and winter of last year and into this year. Um, HMRC, however, saw peaks later on in the year. You can see there it hit nearly 30 million uh, visits uh, in, in late May, um, after as the first lockdown was, was sort of coming to an end and there was more interest in the various economic support schemes for households and businesses. And the visits to HMRC have stayed relatively high and, and indeed have been some of the highest throughout the back end of last year and again into this year. You can see an increase through January there. Um, so there are uh, oh, one final thing I should say on Gov.uk actually um, is uh, we understand it saw its busiest hour ever um, on the 4th of January when the Prime Minister made his announcement about the, the third English lockdown. Now these are just some of the, uh, the impacts of the pandemic we've had moving forward. Um, but we also look at, as I mentioned, the way that um, Boris Johnson and his team, his, his ministers and his advisors, have begun to make changes to how government works. Now following the election victory, um, we know that um, his team had many priorities. They were focusing on getting Brexit done, of course, and we've, we've crossed the, the year anniversary since we left the EU now. Uh, they were talking about levelling up the country and they were talking about reforming the civil service. Uh, on, on civil service reform, you know, many of the issues that they talk about, things like uh, increasing the skills in the civil service, making it more representative of the country at large, professionalising it, they're often things that we've, uh, and reducing turnover as well, they're often things that we've talked about at the Institute. And, uh, and of course, Bromwin mentioned many of these in her annual lecture last week. Um, but actually, we think thus far, it's got off to quite a slow start. And the biggest uh, change really has been changes to the some of the names at the tops of departments that hasn't seen the sort of the more strategic agenda of reform really get going yet. Um, I understand there's some audio issues, so I apologise for that, and we will re-record this presentation. I'm going to keep going for now, but um, apologies for that. So, um, here we see the, um, the names of all the permanent secretaries uh, of central government departments over the last few years. Uh, and here in pink and dark blue, we see those who left their roles in 2020. So the seven in pink uh, left government and Matthew Rycroft in dark blue there moved from DFID to the Home Office. Um, as well as those in pink, we also saw the departures of the heads of MI5, MI6, the Government Legal Service and the Cabinet Secretary, so Mark Sedwell. Now, some of these had come to the end of their five-year terms, and it's just a case of sort of natural turnover, but some, including Sir Philip Rutnam at the Home Office, who resigned um, just before the lockdown and is pursuing a case of constructive dismissal against the government. And Jonathan Slater at the Department for Education, who was dismissed in the summer of last year uh, following the, the problems with exam results, um, left before the end of their term. And this, as well as sort of various briefing in the media, gave the impression that there was quite a political aspect to this agenda of civil service reform and that there was a bit of a breakdown of relationships between the, um, uh, the tops of the heads of departments and, and ministers. And we think that's a real shame because, as I said, you know, the reform agenda is a really important one and we hope that it can move beyond the kind of personal relationships uh, questions that we saw perhaps in 2020 and really um, uh, make a, a sort of uh, uh, an impact in the coming months and years. And we do know that there is appetite amongst both ministers and civil servants for this to continue. So we'll be keeping an eye on that in the coming uh, coming weeks and months. So as well as changes to the civil service team, we have also seen quite a lot of changes to the ministerial team. Um, it's interesting to note that more ministers have resigned from Boris Johnson's government than from, um, the, from previous prime minister's governments at the same point. So this chart shows um, uh, the resignations of ministers under pre various previous prime ministers. And those of you who are Keen IFG watchers will, of course, recognise this as the work of 
uh, my colleague uh, Gavin Freegard, and it continues uh, even though he's moved on to, to pastures new. Um, you can see there that Theresa May had a sort of particularly high rate of resignations in the second half of her premiership as the Brexit debates got particularly heated. But actually, uh, if we look at the resignations uh, from the Johnson government, he has seen more resignations in that first 18 months of his premiership than any of those recent prime ministers. Now, some of those were um, before 2020, they were before the election when he still had a minority government situation, and they include uh, people like Amber Rudd, and of course his brother, Joe Johnson, now Lord Johnson, who resigned um, during the prorogation um, discussion battle at the end of 2019. Um, what's interesting to note about uh, ministerial turnover is actually the cabinet has remained relatively stable in the last 12 months. Uh, Sajid Javid obviously famously left um, uh, the government in February reshuffle, but since then there have been no uh, major changes to the cabinet. Anne-Marie Trevelyan left uh, when Diffid was wound down, but she is back in the government. And Alec Sharma is still attending the cabinet, although he's no longer business secretary. He's full time on the COP presidency. So I think this talks to the loyalty that the prime minister has both for his ministers and that he expects from his ministers. Uh, and we can perhaps get into that in more detail in the discussion. Uh, I will finish with a quick look ahead to some of the big issues in, in the coming 12 months. So the um, I think it's fair to say that the continuing rollout of the vaccine is the priority and uh, we understand you know, ministers are confident that they will hit their target of uh, offering a vaccine to 15 million people in the, the four most vulnerable groups by mid-February um, and then the rollout will continue to the rest of the population after that. I think we're going to see, um, well there's obviously lots of concerns about the various new variants that are circulating and then there's also going to be questions about the extent to which restrictions on daily life continue as the vaccine rollout um, uh, continues. Uh, we know that again there are differing views on conservative backbenchers and we'll see how that debate plays out in the party and in parliament over the coming weeks and months. There are various other issues we can talk about and I hope we'll get into some of these in the discussion but just to run through them quickly some of the things that are likely to be occupying the Prime Minister's uh, time in 2021. Obviously, we have elections planned for the Scottish and Welsh Parliament, and the SNP are pushing for a second independence referendum. So I think that will be a big deal. Um, the UK is hosting COP26 at the end of the year, and focus on, um, on uh, emissions reductions will be a big question. And of course, levelling up and the detail of what that actually means. So I hope we'll get into some of that in discussion. I will finish with a very quick summary of our report which is that the pandemic has seen the government spend huge amounts of money in new ways. It has forced the government to change how it works, but ministers too have introduced changes to how, how things work, although it's got off to a slow start. And then we finish by making the point that 2021 is a year of opportunities for the government to make some progress on those priorities that were put on hold at the beginning of last year, but that there are challenges ahead. I'm very much looking forward to discussing this with you all. Indeed, for that. Um, I was just I was, uh, wondering as you were talking whether we'd ever end up saying oh, there were no challenges ahead, but you're absolutely right, there were some really big ones coming. Um, so you've been through an extraordinary year in numbers looking at what this has meant uh, for, for government. And I wanted to turn first to Meg Hillier. And Meg, you, your um, committee, uh, usually described as, as the powerful or influential public accounts committee, um, you know, has has a lot of uh, access to the numbers, ability to scrutinise what is what is going on. What do you make of this this picture? Well, I think I mean it's it's interesting. It's not perhaps surprising to Whitehall watchers that a lot of what you say in this really useful document, which frankly brings together lots of lots of very important bits of data, is in incredibly chimes with what we're finding on the Public Accounts Committee. So you've touched on procurement and one, we know that the, you know, the rules allow procurement uh, without tender, um, but um, the Coronavirus Act reinforced that in a sense. We, we are surprised that by the time things settled down in that, especially in that period in the summer, there wasn't a bit more thought to giving to one how you do it uh, through a tender, a shorter tender, or maybe even a shortened process, but also that the record keeping about how some of these procurements were done was very poor. And one thing the civil service is usually very good at is the record keeping. And it's really laid the government open to accusations, uh, which you've read about in the papers, whether they're true or not. So, 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 so that has been particularly unhelpful. And that generally feeds into the feeling that we've got um, about the lack of transparency and the inability actually of Parliament to do a really good scrutiny job. In fact, the select
pass on life, a shadow of its former self. No, Civil we, service. We know, yeah. Sorry, just your, your, your point Sorry. there. You just, um, you, you just your final point there. Uh, your final point, your last point. The point about uh, the transparency and scrutiny or ministerial and civil service turnover? That one. There's, there's come on, uh, your point about the ministerial and civil service turnover. Yeah, so we've seen a lot of ministers very new in post and then suddenly having to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. So their lack of experience um, has not been helped by the fact that they're not facing that scrutiny day to day in Parliament. And frankly, it's, it is a great way of learning where you've got gaps and issues that you need yeah. to, to plug and deal with when you're facing backbenchers, you know, full on for an hour in, in the chamber. Yeah. Uh, and, and interestingly, with the civil servants, I was, you know, I've looked, looking through the list, there's only two permanent secretaries that have been in post since I became chair yeah. of the Public Accounts Committee in 20. 2015 uh, and Stephen Love gone from defence so he's been in two departments as has Chris Warmold everybody else has become a, a permanent secretary since I became chair now that's only five well nearly six years um, and mm. it shows that the turnover and the institutional memory issues now Sue may have some thoughts on this are quite an issue I think especially mm. when the government is dealing yeah. with this challenge and I think yeah. the other thing you highlight here of course is the skills in the civil service something my committee talks about all the time and we don't see massive change in that. So at this particular moment, if some of the lessons about skills in procurement and in managing major projects had really worn through, yeah. we would perhaps see some of these issues being dealt with better. Um, and yet we're still seeing, in fact, quite a lot of the new permanent secretaries are in some ways old style mandarins and that have come from a policy background. They haven't run major projects. And I think that uh, does show a bit in some of the things that, that that's going uh, wrong with the government. I'm having problems hearing as well as maybe my okay. sound being heard by other people. So maybe I had pause All there, right. Bronwyn. All right, so uh, Meg, that, that's brilliant. I want to come back to you on the point about our procurement and lack of transparency and what your your uh, council committee might might do in in calling for um, uh, um, um information on that and, and so on let's come back to that point sue um what did you make of the report and indeed of meg's challenges to you about some of these old issues uh, seemingly unchanging issues about civil service well um congratulations on the report it's always a great read uh, and this one is uh no exception, it's it's really very uh, good. Um, I mean, it sets out very well how fast uh, the civil service was able to, to mobilize. Um, uh, and I think that, you know, the treasury have behaved uh, amazingly well. Um, you know, DWP were able to deal with a huge spike in universal credit uh, fairly seamlessly too. Um, a, a, an area that people never congratulate that I'd like to call out is the debt management office who have, you know, financed all this debt, just shoveling it out week after week. Uh, that's the sort of operational bit of the treasury um, doing really, uh, really well. I think the problems have come, um, you know, the areas you've highlighted, but also um, th there have been problems, you know, where delivery mechanisms are muddled. Um, uh, so in um, you know exam results and and the health service, um, or where where there's a sort of delivery um, interface with local authorities or mayors or devolved administrations, that's where there's been more um, difficulty. Um, well, I just on that point, I, I, I very much wanted your views on exactly that point of whether you look as you look back over the difficulties of the past year, you think some of the trouble. Uh, comes from the difficulty of central government working with local authorities? Well, my personal view is, is that it does, yes. Um, and I think, you know, um, in, say with devolved administrations, I mean, in very many cases, it's just that that interface, say with health um, and the police, where some are devolved and some are not, um, I think there are, there are important uh, issues there. And certainly, I mean, I don't know how delivery in the health service works, I, and I think it's a challenge for anyone to to uh, to set out clearly. Um, and I think you know a lot of the a lot of the problems uh, we saw arising there. 
I think one of the good things that has come out of um, both of Brexit and out of COVID is I think that it, it ministers do realise more now that that delivery, understanding delivery, and baking that in very early in the policy process is is really important. You can't come along with some fancy policy idea uh, and expect it to happen unless you really understand um, how it's going to be delivered. So I, I hope that that kind of understanding uh, will will now um, continue and uh, you know that we will bring delivery people in much, much earlier in the formulation of new policy. Mm. And is it just going to this point about how new some of the ministers are, indeed some of the civil servants, but particularly ministers, when you talk about delivery and you've got a brand new minister coming into the department, whose responsibility is it to get that delivery working well? Well, in my last job, I, I was when I was permanent secretary at DCMS, um, I had six different uh, secretaries of state. Um, and so turnover amongst ministers is is not ideal. Um, we have had slightly more continuity, as your report points out, at cabinet level, but less at junior minister level. But if you are going to have a lot of turnover amongst the ministers, it's helpful to have more stability um, amongst the civil servants. So this particular last 12 months where you've had a lot of, as Meg pointed out, a lot of turnover in, in both cases, is not um, helpful. But, yeah. you know, I think it, one point I always make to people is that mostly when um, Secretaries of State come, come in, mo most commonly they don't know anything about their role. I mean, yeah. maybe after an election, there's a change of government and, and you have someone who has shadowed a department, they will already know something. Maybe you get an unusual circumstance like I had with John Whittingdale, who had um, he came in as Secretary of State, he'd never been a minister, but he mm. hadn't had a select committee for 10 years. So, yeah. he, knew his, so, um, so he was steeped in the issues already. One of the roles of a, a permanent secretary is yeah. to find out very quickly how a new Secretary of State uh, can get up to speed in a way that yeah. is comfortable for them. Yeah. Okay, well, look, thanks very much in, in, indeed for that. I'm, again, I'm going to come back on, on some of these points. But Lewis, I'd, lo I'd love your first take on this. Yeah, of course. Uh, but what I just to say, as others have said, um, you know, uh, uh, as as ever with this report, an absolute gold mine of information, fantastically presented, particularly for journalists trying to understand, you know, the really dramatic transformations that are going on in Whitehall um, from the outside. Just talk about a couple of the things that you've, you've asked me to talk about. One of the questions, as so, you know, will we see a return to previous modes of working in Whitehall? And I think there's clearly a, a macro take and a, a micro take and a macro take that actually would be repeated throughout lots of society. Uh, on this. On the micro level, clearly, as your report well illustrates, and indeed very dramatic finding of the sheer numbers of civil servants working from home, over 90% as opposed to 3% before the crisis, uh, clearly some of that will endure for some time to come. Some of it will unwind inevitably, to much of the relief, I'm sure, of civil servants. There has been enormous recruitment as well, as uh, we saw uh, at the beginning, now getting to half the level as it was um, uh, after the cuts of the coalition. Clearly, some of that is going to endure as well. Although I think the open question will be as to what extent the government wants to retain that over uh, the coming years. And I think that will be um, a theme that we'll return to in terms of how the government approach public sector spending and how it's going to see how, la how, it, how large it thinks the state should be in the future, which, which I'll, I'll return to. The more interesting, though, macro tech, I think, is clearly that the, you know, the civil service has been operating in a state of crisis management for... Certainly, you could argue for five years, certainly for the last two years when we had the ticking Brexit clock going down, much reconfiguration required, and now COVID, as your report makes clear, actually the former was quite helpful in terms of the latter, um, if, if, in a way. But clearly, the question is, is to what extent the civil service can successfully unwind from some of that crisis management and go back to more typical uh, modes of delivery and more typical um, operation. We just don't know that yet because we just don't know what 2021 is uh, going to bring. The other question, of course, is around civil service reform. Um, and I think there is a really big question mark now about what that means. You could say there's a question mark for what it meant even when Dominic Cummings was there. But like, my feeling and instinct is, is that without Cummings, there probably won't be the intellectual impetus and driving force because it really was something that obsessed him, rightly or wrongly. Um, yeah. And I, one feels that without that driving force politically, 
whether it just sort of goes off the boil, you could say that's a good thing or a bad thing, but I think that is uh, undoubtedly uh, the case. There are other things that I think will endure, though. One of them, which we have heard a lot about, which I think is really central to how the government sees things politically, not least with all of the red wall uh, Tory MPs that there now are, which is relocation. I think that will be a, a, a driving force for the government, something of the sort of Cummings intellectual inheritance, if you like, that will survive. But whether it's any wider in terms of reform, other than just where the civil servants are, I'm a little bit sceptical about that now. The second question, how will government approach uh, challenges 2021? Obviously, we just... Let, let's um, hold, hold that one, Lewis, because I'm going to come on to that, and I want, I want everyone's views on that. But, or can I just ask you something first? Of course. Which is um, what you make of the U-turns. Uh, it obviously is a great staple of, of media reporting on the government, and here comes another one, and our our chart, um, you know, in, in nice, cheerful-looking um, uh, blobs, uh, bright blue blobs, um, uh, um, underplays the drama of these things, rather. As you look back and you report on policy for, um, uh, for the BBC, do you feel that these are avoidable um, or, or or just this was such a dramatic year that really the government should be given a pass that it couldn't have foreseen all these things? I think clearly some are. I think it's very difficult to talk sort of in general um, about this. I think what you could probably say is that as the crisis has endured, probably some of the U-turns have become perhaps less excusable over time, or less understandable. Clearly, when things were first going on, the level of knowledge, I think we forget now, was so sub arctic really, so unbelievable. We, you know, we were really sort of groping around civil servants, journalists, politicians, everyone, sort of groping around in the dark, trying to see what this was. I think it depends very much on a case-by-case -case basis. I think something in terms of looking to the which is what I was going to say, is that in some ways, I have had some sympathy for the government in terms of U-turns, in the sense that what this crisis, this crisis has been so illuminating, has it? It's been so revelatory about the weaknesses and strengths of governance models, not only in Britain, but around the world. And we have had the absurdity sometimes. We have done a lot of reports on education. You know, the absurdity of our system where you have schools which are, you know, literally waiting by the phone at the end of the night or waiting by the computer waiting for the latest diktat from the Department for Education, the latest bit of guidance from the Department for Education, being worked up by civil servants who very often, for understandable reasons, perhaps even set foot in a classroom as uh, an adult. That is very, very difficult. And that goes to the heart, basically, of our governance model, which is that England, anyway, you know, is extremely centralised. We don't have the regional structures in place. Exactly. Yeah. And so on. And, you know, I think that, you know, and I think this is basically a theme of, of what is to come. I think we are at a, a turning point in terms of governance in this country. We could use this as clearly an opportunity on all sorts of ways. Mm -hmm. With the union, we talked about a little bit, re-establishing uh, what the relationship between is, is between the centre and the periphery, Whitehall and so on. There is clearly an opportunity for some really big, potentially transformational thinking in how the British constitution operates between all of these things. And it could be there for the taking, but of course there's also the opportunity to do what the British Constitution and people who operate the British Constitution often do, which is just paper over the cracks and hope it goes away. And much of that simply depends on what is in Boris Johnson's head. How he got the man, he's got the majority, he's got the mandate. How does he choose to exercise it? And that goes for all the yeah. things in the, in the, over the yeah. year. And you've taken us to, to exactly the point I, I, I wanted, um, which is looking ahead at the year and some of the things that Tim mentioned right at, right at the end uh, that the government is uh, indisputably facing. Let's, let's pick the one that is the government's choice that it was elected on, uh, uh, levelling up. And Tim, I, I wonder what your thoughts are about the nature of this challenge, because people are now, they're, they're looking back over the, uh, this extraordinary year with many, many bumps. They're trying to work out in their own minds whether they think Britain is um, was well governed, whether the government uh, should be forgiven for some, some of the, the um, uh, what looked like now is clear missteps. Um, what to think of the, the question of, you know, does the country run well? And then we have, we have these things coming up. Um, so the, the levelling up, the government has said it, it wants to do this. Do we have any sense of what it means? Could we, could we, could we draw a chart of the metrics of, of levelling up? No, I think it's I think it's a really good question, and it, it's a point uh, we make at the end of our report. Is the definition of levelling up? I think is is still the big question now. Um, there was some um, there was some article, wasn't there, talking about what MPs thought of it, and and someone said that uh, uh, one of their constituents potholes, and maybe it is about potholes because people care about potholes, but I don't think that's what the PM means when he's talking. Um, I think it's going to be really interesting to see. Um, what the longer term sort of decisions are, as referring to what Lewis said, both in terms of the role of the centre and the role of, of the sort of national government versus um, local 
local government. Do, do ministers, by levelling up, do they want to empower local government more, to take more decisions, to have more control over, over money, um, rather than, as we saw through this year, you know, you had, uh, as Lewis says, not just schools, it was sort of lockdowns in local areas, you know, ministers were making decisions and saying Leicester is going to go into lockdown, Manchester is going to go into lockdown, and where those areas had high elected mayors and they were able to sort of put their case to ministers through the media if nothing else and mm. argue for more support but is that really sustainable long-term um devolution of power i'm not sure it is but i think there's a question about devolution of power and, and and budgets which is what you know that's where the real power comes from um, but also um i guess a question about um again picking up on something that lewis said about where does the government want to be so there's we hear lots of discussion mm -hmm moving civil servants out of London, is that part of leveling up? Because sure. if it's about bringing other people into the civil service, then it might help. But if it's about rebalancing the economy between the southeast and the rest of the country, I'm not sure that moving even 20,000 civil servants will be one more. Yeah. yeah. Tim, thanks very much indeed. So, I mean, Meg, turn, turning to you, what does your committee make of leveling up? Well, uh, look at the Towns Fund, and that's a good example of uh, how something, well, a clue, I think, perhaps, about how levelling up will work. And you go back to what the Chancellor said, I think it was in November when he came to the House for the fiscal statement, and he talked about the levelling up fund and was fielding lots of requests for funding from his backbenchers. At the moment, it's very vague on the criteria, and the Towns Fund, remember, rolled up the uh, stronger Towns Fund, the High Streets Fund, and the extra money that came in and became something different. And from the beginning, it was set up as a scheme that really allowed on a lot of allowed a lot of political judgment to be built in at that final decision making uh, stage, and so it kind of cut okay on the ministerial direction end of it because it was designed from the beginning to allow that political decision making, yeah. um, and that suggests to me that it. I mean, from what we've heard about the leveling up fund, there are not clear criteria. In fact, I've been approached. I'm approached by members of all parties and local local councils and local councillors concerned because they don't feel that the criteria are clear therefore they're worried about it not being fair and they usually of course come to see they talk to me and i'm sure they talk to lobby ministers when they haven't had the money that they would would like to have and they've seen their neighboring constituency or town or borough get funding so it's a bit it's very different now you know you, you when you think about the big regeneration funding um, of the Labour years. In fact, the previous Conservative government prior to that, they were huge, big bits of work. They were very clear criteria. They had, um, you know, they wouldn't all work, but they you could you could see whether you've qualified to bid. With this, it's very different. It's much more free flowing, we think. And so one of the things we're going to be looking at is exactly impressing government what what are the criteria and are they fair and are they clear so that people know why they've won and why they haven't. And in terms of the outcomes, Again, quite muddled, I think. Mm. No, that's, that's interesting. And I suspect one of the questions about putting metrics to this is going to be where you start from, because a lot of metrics will have gone down in the past year. A lot of, you know, a lot of life has got, got much tougher. Sue, so, I mean, we know you know, leveling up was the, the government's new um, slogan, um, a couple of words, but um, governments uh, for a long time have been trying to do things about parts of the UK um, outside London. What was it like in your department trying to you know, help um, uh, the rest of the country access these things that, that came under your department? Well, I think um, one one of the issues, uh, and this has been highlighted uh, increasingly by COVID, is an awareness of who are the people that the government are serving and the way that COVID has had a very differential impact by ethnicity and region and the type of housing people live in. Um, and so I think that does mean that, you know, we, we do need to diversify the civil service further. We have done by things like, you know, gender and so on, but we still need people from a wider range of backgrounds who bring um, a wider range of experience. Now, of course, we do have um, members of parliament in every constituency all over the country, but somehow that that richness of, of the kind of nature of the population and how it differs in different places doesn't really come through into policy. So one of the things that we were trying to do in, in DCMS when I left, and happily it is going to um, happen now, is to open up an office in Manchester um at, there were lots of reasons for that but well, one of them was to have uh, a wider range of people that we could draw on but also because um we felt that there was a uh, the, the right kind of skills there the tech hub uh, and and so on 
Um, so that that will um, I think that that you know more departments will move people uh, out of London. But you know, don't let's forget that only about seven percent of the civil service is working in policy, uh, and that, that is largely in London. So most of the delivery people already are not in London. Hmm. And Lewis, I mean, what do you think about um, the tech companies are playing in this? Obviously, they, they've owned the lockdown in a way. Uh, the government now wants everyone to be um, able to get get uh, dig excellent digital services. Where, where do you see this going? So, sorry, Brian, the tech companies? Yes. Um, getting digital access and so on across the country. Well, I mean, you know, for sure, something that I've... Um, you know, reported on a lot is is the uh, digital divide which is going on in schools and uh, education. Uh, it is, uh, you know, a, a profound, it's been a profound problem. It continues to be a profound problem despite the fact that the Department for Education has shipped a lot of devices and laptops, but it continues to be a problem even just in terms of many yeah. children having data. So, you know, it is a, a really, uh, you know, it's a really significant problem. But like so many other things, the, the pandemic has merely illuminated problems and potentially exacerbated problems we already have. I mean, when we're talking about levelling up, um, you know, this is not, it's not as if sometimes I'm struck when we're talking about levelling up and some of these other issues. It's not as if no government before has had the idea of trying to execute a regional policy. They have. I mean, New Labour had the regional development agencies, poured huge amounts of money in. Cameron and the coalition had economic zones. They almost, almost all had one. We've got a, a, another great chart on this. Exactly, quite. And so it's not as if this is, you know, the point is, it's really hard. You know, Britain, mm -hmm. England in particular, a very unequal country in terms of income. You know, we have some of the poorest regions uh, in Europe. And I think this is going to be a real theme, as I was sort of alluding to earlier, about what is going to happen in the years to come. To what extent has the Conservative Party actually really bought into a different model and vision of political economy? Has mm -hmm. it really moved on substantially intellectually, uh, for good or ill, from Thatcherite, more economically liberal instincts. Now, Cummings definitely, as I say, was a driving intellectual force behind that. To what extent is that still shared by the rest of the Conservative Party? We're going to see this, you know, at play in immediate decisions in the months ahead on things like universal credit in terms of the spending review, the upcoming budget. My instinct is is that actually it hasn't moved as substantially as some of the overall kind of commentary on this might suggest. And for example, the free school meals. Uh, you know, debacle has it has occurred on several occasions. Yeah. I think it's proof of that. And so, and you're going to be, this is going to be happening, by the way, in a context potentially of mass unemployment, where the state has been the employer of last resort as well as the lender of, of last yeah. resort. So I think much depends on the psychology of the Conservative Party and, as I say, on Boris Johnson himself. Yeah, no, you, you, you put it, you put it very well. And I, I was saying in my um, lecture uh, last week that the, this, some civil servants talk about the, the scale of. Uh, the recovery from all this and, and repair of things like missing education and so on—it resembles something facing the Attlee government after yeah. after after the war. Um, let's go to some questions now because there's some very good ones coming in. Let me start with one from Diane Reddle, who says, "Should all senior service uh, level and new MPs have a training program on all the elements of work in the civil service to make policy and procurement more more agile?" Um, Sue, do you want to pick that up? Um, but uh, you all might have something to say on it. Well, of course, the um, Institute for Government already lay on some uh, very good uh, options for new ministers in in terms of, of learning how to be minister and how the how the system works. Um, obviously, you know, any extra training is always a good thing. It's a question of uh, finding time for it. Uh, I mean, I don't know whether the questionnaire is thinking just of policy people um, or, or everyone um, uh, in, in the civil service. I think uh, it's worth saying that in some areas, there has been a very big push that has paid off. And I don't know if Meg will have views on this, but um, there's been a very big push in the last uh, three or four years on project management and on professionalizing um, the commercial and the procurement functions. Now, there may be further to go, but uh, it's we're certainly in a very different place from where we were uh, a decade ago. Meg, what, what do you reckon? I certainly think that that's, you know, that 
the, the civil service has embraced the training. Um, I think um, Sue says, right, there's been some progress, but it's been lamentably slow. I mean, I've been on the committee nearly coming up to 11 years this year, um, chair for nearly six. And, it, you know, we, we it's a bit like Groundhog Day. You know, we constantly are looking at the skills. We were looking yesterday, uh, for example, at the um, the, the did going digital services at the border. This is a program that started in 2003. I mean, I, I won't go through the pain of what's happened along the way, but that's an example of some of the project management and procurement failures. So we there's still some way to go. And we still see permanent secretaries, frankly, being appointed because they're clever at policy, not because they've got a track record in delivery. I don't want to see whether Sue's got anything to say about that, but I think that that is an issue. And I don't know if you know, I still we still don't know why that is. We keep saying we're pushing for people with more projects. Because in terms of MPs, it's interesting. I was talking to some generals with Tobias Elwood, who chairs the Defence Select Committee, the other day, and we pointed out to them that any one of the any MP, any one of 650 MPs potentially, perhaps not the Speaker, but you know, could potentially be Defence Secretary tomorrow. You know, and uh, or there's a general election straight afterwards, which horrified them. But that's the reality. And I think I agree. We need more training. It's difficult to pin MPs down for that. What would be good though is if all uh, certainly shadow front benches and all ministers ministers are now going through some project management training and leadership mm. training which is a good start um it's something that richard bacon who was for 16 years a member of the public accounts committee and i've been trying to champion but difficult to get bite on but actually you know the labor front bench is quite keen to learn this sort of thing some of them are beating a path to my door to ask about you know some of the issues going on so they get to know the department they are shadowing better i think that's a small step in the right direction but we need it really something that's just built in and remember how busy mps are i think it's hard for them to justify finding the time actually it's hugely useful i think, I think that's exactly, exactly right and no, no, my my um you know experiences is quite hard to corral anyone because they've got so many urgent things to do maybe not more important but more more urgent um and um yeah no, no, no. <laughs> i know when we do gather people together for this as the mobile phones going off all the time um i think you're right though it's in any shadow team that there's a real incentive to learn about this because it's a way of learning about um their department and and, and knowing that they might be very suddenly parachuted into it. Uh, Sue, what do you reckon, training? Uh, well, we, I talked about training uh, um, just, just now. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, on the point about whether permanent secretaries should have yeah. um, delivery experience, I mean, absolutely, um, Meg is right there, and we have had some yeah. uh, exceptional cases. I mean, Leslie Strathy, who ran HMRC, you know, joined DWP out of school at 16 and worked her way yeah. up and you know sadly died in post um later um and we have had others uh in hmrc in particular um but at the end of the day um you know the policy delivery people do apply for these roles yeah. and don't get them because ministers don't choose them because yeah. it's not a it's not a skill that's valued in the heat of having to go to cabinet and i guess that's what i was getting out of whether they're just they're just they're just not picked they may be extremely well trained in these things um but um it just doesn't have uh, what ministers want when it finally comes to saying look i want to work with this person well that's right and of course ministers don't stay uh, long enough in post uh, very often to kind of reap the consequences yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's come on to another one um from Martin Wheatley saying, um, to what extent do weaknesses in the response to the pandemic simply show our problems which are apparent already, or have they covered issues of which we were unaware previously? Or I guess you could say whether the pandemic is, uh, you know, of itself. Um, new things, Lewis. What do you what do you reckon? This comes back to the point I was making about you know what should we what what, what should everyone in this country make of the government? Well, I, it goes back really at the risk of repeating myself to what I said before. I think uh, you know the, the the pandemic has been revelatory uh, in, in in exposing all manner of problems that largely the extent to one extent to a greater extent or other uh, already were there. Um, but it, so much of it, I think, does go down ultimately to our governance model and the weaknesses and strengths of it. Now we can see that at play in both and ill. We see with the vaccine rollout, for example, that this sort of small, quite centralised state with quite a Monolithic health service has actually been tremendously effective in rolling something out, which to some extent it already does in terms of vaccine programs, but really, really effective and has been a minor triumph, well, not a minor triumph, triumph from mm. policy making in the sense of ministers giving the vaccine task force the flexibility and the you know flexibility that it needed to do its job. But we've also seen uh, in terms of many other in terms of many other aspects to take tiering, for example, 
the profound problems in you know trying to exercise from Whitehall and pull levers in Whitehall to exercise, in effect, a form of political regional policy. And it just hasn't worked. It's been very notable that throughout, you know, the only thing that's really worked in terms of suppressing cases, making the public sit up and take notice, mm. national measures, national lockdown and so on. And also, you know, we've also seen, I think for, for me, one of the you know, great, the most interesting themes that continues to develop has clearly been the relationship between Westminster and involved authorities. The pandemic has exposed the British constitution for how it really is and how it really operates rather than how we were taught it and how we think that it should operate. And, you know, in terms of the relationship and the lack of control, actually, that Westminster exercises uh, in many ways. And clearly that is going to be, that tension is going to be a real theme, particularly with regards to them, but with Northern Ireland well uh, in the months and, and over the course of 2021. Hmm. Tim, can I bring you on on, on this? I mean, you, you and your team have got um, years and years and years of the, the, these charts. And what do you say to Martin's question about, you know, are these um, is it exposed problems or, or did we know whether they were there? I I think, uh, again, sort of building on what Lewis said, a lot of it is about that sort of, and, and a theme from the whole discussion, is that disconnect between what happens in Whitehall and this Whitehall monitor because mm. Whitehall is the street that where most government departments are based. But you know what we're talking about is the central, central, government, the civil service that administers uh, the public sector. Um, the disconnect between Whitehall and those government departments and the people across the country who deliver those public services day to day. So yes, you know the the teachers for an, for an instruction from DfE or the um, the professionals who are waiting for. Um, PPE to be ordered by civil servants in the Department of Health and Social Care or Public Health England. I think as well it reveals, one thing it has revealed, um, and I think I'm, I'm sure Martin himself will have views on this, I know he will, but one thing it has revealed is the sort of the kind of patchwork of public organisations, arms length bodies and non-departmental public bodies and all these kind of organisations that do different things for the state but nobody i don't think at the beginning had a clear grip on how all of them work so the uh, most famous example i think is public health england itself where um there have been numerous press briefings where it's been said you know ministers are taking control of public health england and can direct public health england to do what it needs to do and actually ministers have always been in charge of public health england they just didn't realize the extent to which they were and the okay. between yeah. officials in the department of health and social care and the civil servants, still civil servants, but not central government civil servants working in PHE weren't clear. And so the sort of flow of information up and down was was not working well. So I think yeah. that communication um, between yeah, central offices in people doing the work across yeah. the country was a big gap. There's several things that I'd like to explore and they echo some of the questions uh, we, we, we've got. Um, Including another one from uh, Diane Riddle about about whether civil servants have to be hub based or whether they can be uh, um, work more remotely and and so on. Um, but this question of, of whether ministers know about public bodies is something I was touching on in my talk last week. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm afraid the impression one has sometimes is is that they they really care about who leads these public bodies, um, but sometimes don't dig into them more. Um, more deeply than that um, until there's a the crisis. And then the trouble is the IFG has written for a long time is that these public bodies were set up at all kinds of different times, have different relationships with government or parliament. And um, it, it's really quite complicated, including legally complicated. So what, what is your experience of this? You're, you're the department um, uh, which you were running had many, many such agencies. Yes, we had um, 45 um, and they they were different. I mean, there was BBC and Channel 4, there were regulators uh, such as the Gambling Commission and Ofcom, um, uh, there were arts bodies uh, and spending bodies in the arts and sport and tourism and so on. Um, we used to get all our arms length bodies together with ministers and each other at least twice a year. Um, and I, I felt there was actually quite a good appreciation of what they what they do they were also the place where a lot of expertise lay um uh you know the number of people employed across all those bodies uh, far exceeded the number in the department um so i thought it worked um uh, very very well although you know none of them were doing the kinds of things that public health uh, england were doing they didn't have i mean the museums and so on had interface uh, with the public but um 
as I say, in, in that case, I thought them, actually the ministers had pretty good understanding. Yeah. Um, and what do we feel about this, this question that I, that I mentioned about whether civil servants um, should be re relocated, uh, whether in fact more people should be recruited um, from places outside London uh, and kept working there. And the, the, I, I entirely agree with the suggestion before that um, the heat has gone out of some of the, certainly the noise has gone out of some of the civil service reform agenda. And I uh, wonder whether some of the heat and energy has as well, but we'll, we'll have to see. But the one bit that the government does seem to be still talking about is relocation. Tim, again, could you give us a bit of an insight into this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's very much a question as to sort of what you want to do. So we know, for example, that over two thirds of the senior civil service, the SCS, are in London, and those are often you know, the people who are meeting ministers very regularly. Um, whereas departments, for example, DWP, HMRC, that have a big kind of public facing um, presence and, and therefore people at lower rates, understandably, have a kind of more of a nationwide presence because they are, you know, there's a every town, so they need to have people there to, to stuff. Um, so I think it depends what you want those civil servants to be doing. And often one of the kind of for moving people out of London has been the need to be with with ministers uh, or or at least be able to get sure. to ministers, um, easily um, so I think it'll be interesting to see whether the pandemic has changed ministers demands on that and if there is really is this political impetus to move civil servants if ministers are <laughs> that they will be having video calls with civil servants sure. rather than face-to-face -face meetings um, sure. as I mentioned in, uh, earlier I think you know, one of the questions, and, and some colleagues of, of ours have looked into this, there is a great report on this on our website. The broader question is, what is your objective? Is if it's about, you know, economic uh, reinvigoration of uh, sort of a post-industrial town somewhere, then actually moving a thousand civil servants, who most of whom might commute in from the nearest big city anyway, isn't going to do that. It, it's, you've got to be clear, I think the government needs to be clear on what its objectives are, and then decide mm -hmm. who the right civil servants to put where in order to achieve that objective are. Yeah, that sounds exactly right. It, it, Lewis, what do you make of this? Do you take it seriously when the government talks about relocation and what would you like to see? I think I think they are serious about it because, as I say, I think that it is something, it is it is quite a, a relatively easy way of showing some commitment to Red Wall constituencies and Red Wall uh, MP, which, you know, make no mistake, the government thinks about all the time. Boris Johnson thinks about all the time. Uh, you know, he knows that's the key to safeguarding his majority which after this year actually funnily enough is not going to feel so crazily far away and um but i think that i think completely as I said i think ultimately it is never going to be more than a sticking plaster and a quite minor part of what could be a really important approach to regional policy you know i think being far more interesting and far more important and what i suspect is probably gone from this without cummings is you know, a really thoughtful, uh, you know, more thoughtful approach to thinking, actually, you know, what do we want our regions to look like? And do we want to empower our regions to make more decisions? That would be a more politically, potentially long-term transformation, transformatory thing. I suspect, though, that funnily enough, in terms of some of the noises that we've heard from Downing Street and from Boris Johnson, particularly with regards to devolution to Scotland and elsewhere, that Boris Johnson has become, if anything, during this crisis, more sceptical towards the idea of devolving power, not more mm. of it, certainly political power anyway, because, and you know, one can understand this in far as it goes, you know, ministers still in our political discourse, they want to sit there and pull levers and for stuff to happen. That doesn't happen enough, I think, from their point of view. Yeah. Yeah. So they're then devolving more power, you know, I, th I, I think that actually, if anything, this, yeah. this crisis has actually put, made ministers and the prime minister himself probably more sceptical about that prospect than anything. So much better. Really, really, really interesting. No, th thanks very much indeed. Okay, we've got about uh, two, three minutes left. Um, so you wanted to make a point about scientists. Yes, well, th there's something that, you know, your, your report raises. Um, and one of the things that has, I think, come out beneficially out of the whole COVID thing is an appreciation of the the role of scientists and you know having folk like JVT become household names and this was this is one of the Cummings uh, things that I I really feel very strongly about that I totally agree on that we we don't make good enough use of the scientists we've got and I don't think we employ uh, enough scientists and I think there is something dodgy in the civil service exams that that filters scientists out so um you know this this plays to 
the whole digital agenda, everything. I think um, that's something uh, which we mustn't lose uh, beyond the pandemic. Okay, thank you. We had a recent speech from Sir John Kingman, uh, who said the thing that filters them out is money. Uh, because they can go elsewhere to, anyway, to, to be discussed. Meg, I said I was going to come back to you on this point about procurement, and it sounds like a really dry word, but actually it is the kind of thing that sends people or the um, public absolutely spare. They have a sense uh, of government um, wasting their money, not bidding for, uh, not having competitive bidding, giving it to apparent cronies, whatever. What, what can your committee do about it? Well, we've already been looking at some of this. So we've been looking at generally a PPE and um, wider procurement issues. So we've done our early work. Some of that's going to come out in the next couple of weeks. But we're also very keen to have some of the companies that bid, the, both those that, that got contracts. Some of them had been set up for less than 50 days and then won multi-million pound contracts paid for by taxpayers. So, uh, the, you know, whatever... Well, the rights and wrongs are very interesting questions there, putting it politely. Um, and also those that bid, but you know, with a good track record, but didn't get through the VIP list or whatever. And I think it's really instructive. And we know, don't we, that government does tend to shift. It goes towards its strategic suppliers. We, we've, we've looked at the paperwork on those strategic suppliers. And I know when you know the ins and outs of how they work, you see the plates spinning, a contract here about to fail. The, the contractor just about gets it back on track while they're bidding on the other side of government for another contract. Yeah. And this their free performance is not taken enough into account in our view as a committee. We think that that ought to be something that's factored in. So and I think it's what's really, in a way, as a dividend, if I can put it quite, perhaps the wrong word from COVID, is that more members of the public are looking at procurement, the dry word, and understanding that it's their tax, their money yeah. That's, yeah. that's doing this. And they care a lot more about it, perhaps, I think, possibly than they did, you know, a year ago. And I, so I think there's a real opportunity yeah. there as part of a reform of the system to bring the public with us. I think, I think that's absolutely right. And that's the, the point of making some noise about it. Well, we're going to have to stop there. Uh, and we've had a terrific range of questions. I'm really sorry for the many that I couldn't get in. Uh, I haven't deliberately uh, touched um, in great detail on, on devolution and the devolved administration, something that Tim mentioned that is absolutely coming up with the elections uh, due, at least, uh, in, in May. Um, uh, we are, have got a great stream of work coming out of that on the money side, on the performance of the devolved administrations, on the constitutional questions and um, and how it all runs uh, between now and the date of when those elections are due. So do keep following us for that. But with that, I'm, I'm going to have to wrap it up. Thank you all very, very much for joining us for this. Tim and team, large team, um, very, very well done. Always glad to see this surface and have a chance to talk about it all. And great thanks uh, from us all to Meg, Sue and Lewis. Thanks for joining us.